All right, ready when you are. Great. Hey, well, thank you for doing this interview today. Really appreciate it. Um, no problem. The chance to watch the documentary, I really enjoyed it. it oh. Wasn't what I was expecting in some ways, but it was like better than I was expecting. Honestly. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so it was great. No. Really. Out of curiosity, what were you expecting? I don't know. I thought, honestly, like it was a little meta that it was a documentary about Christian films that was like on a Christian film platform. Yeah. So like, Maybe it'll just be talking about how great Christian films are. And no. No. Yeah, I liked no. that it was very honest and very... Um, I don't know, balanced approach to it, I guess. So I appreciated that. Yeah, maybe too balanced, if I'm being honest, because uh, <laughs> within the within the world of Christian film, not that I'm particularly well known, but to the degree that I am, uh, I'm uh, I'm particularly harsh with Christian film. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I the the guys who run Faith Life, they. Uh, they saw a lecture of mine that I gave at the International Christian Film Festival. I give one pretty much every year. And it usually winds up being some variation on these are bad and need to be better. Um, and here are some examples of good things. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, they're very much in sympathy with the idea that, like, this, this can be better. Um, but I think I was trying to, understanding that the audience I'm going for, hypothetically, is like other uh, is like Christian movie fans. Um, I, I didn't want to be, t be overly harsh and instead focus on the fact that like there is potential here. It's just almost completely unrealized. Right. Right. So I was kind of curious, like what audience you were going for, because obviously it's on that platform. Yeah. Um, and that admittedly that platform is also a little bit, it's a little bit more academic uh, than than other uh, Christian platforms. Sorry, there's a garbage truck right outside, so I apologize. Um, but uh, so yeah, so I knew that like I, this is not something I would have pitched to say Pure Flix because I don't think they would have gone for it. Um, but the 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 people at Faith Life, a lot of their original uh, productions are documentaries and kind of more like a exploring like Christian apologetics and that sort of thing. And so I figured like, okay, this is something that they would probably like. Uh, as far as the, the intended audience, it was, it's sort of two pronged. One is Christians who are intrigued by movies uh, as an art form. And I guess possibly as a ministry tool, but largely as an art form uh, so much so that they would watch this sort of out of curiosity and see just how, how rich, uh, uh, you know, a history film has. Um, but the flip side of that is, is um, fellow critics and academics. Um, I've been a film critic since 2007. And then somewhat recently, like in the last few years, I've started teaching college classes uh, and that sort of thing. And so one thing that I am often frustrated by is the way that critics who predominantly, I would say, are not Christian and uh, you know, no, no offense to anybody that isn't, but uh, tend to be not Christian. And so they, they're not, we, we all have a bias. We all believe things. And if somebody believes something other than that, even if we are as tolerant as we can be and, and accepting as we can be, like we still think that person is incorrect. And I do think that there is a tendency amongst critics, and I say this as someone who's been among them for many years, uh, and, and by the way, I apologize if I wind up painting with too broad a brush and wind up uh, offending you. Um, but I do think that there is a tendency uh, amongst critics to like, they have, they tend to have specific political beliefs, specific spiritual beliefs. And if a film, if a film like, essentially says, well, I have a different set of beliefs and I'm not ashamed of it, as opposed to something like uh, Silence by Martin Scorsese, which is about faith, but heavily involved, incorporates doubt. Um, you know, uh, in, in film critic circles, it, it does often seem like the best possible way to make a movie about faith and have it be well-reviewed is to entertain the notion heavily that it's wrong. Um, and so, a lot of the uh, a lot of the problem that I have found that Christian uh, that that uh, film critics have with Christian film is that it's simply sure of itself, and so the word propaganda gets thrown around a lot. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, and these same critics would understandably 
praise the 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 Soviet films of the 1920s, which actually was propaganda. Right. And so it's one of those things where it's like, so, and, and and tons of movies have a viewpoint. I myself have very little patience for Michael Moore, but his films are usually pretty well reviewed, and he act, he actively manipulates footage to get to forward his point of view. If that's not propaganda, I don't know what is. And I feel like the word gets thrown around a little bit too easily by, by everybody. Uh, and so I, I don't like, I don't like the dismissal of Christian film as a concept. Most of the movies are almost unwatchable, but as a concept, they can be good. It can be good. And when I look at the way, and when you look at the review at one review after another, it's weird. I can't argue with any of their artistic points, but then they start to move into other things and start to talk about the, the, the um, motivation or even just the philosophy behind these movies and they condemn that. And it's like, well, now you're just getting into, you don't agree with these people. And so it's like, so it causes me to wonder if this film, if, if, you know, fireproof a movie I don't like, but if, if the movie was great, if it was wonderfully written with wonderful acting, but it still espoused this Christian idea of what the marriage dynamic is, you like you, the critic might still might still condemn it, even though your your issue has to do with its philosophy. And you know, I I I'm not immune to this. I'm frustrated when a film sort of leads with its philosophy, especially if it winds up forgiving a lot of its artistic or narrative flaws as a result. You know, I'm a, I really do not care for the movie Vice. Um, and granted, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a particularly big fan of Dick Cheney, but I feel like Adam McKay was so uncurious. Like he, one thing he knew is that he doesn't like Dick Cheney and doesn't want you to like Dick Cheney, doesn't want you to like Dick Cheney either. That's how it is at the beginning of the movie, in the middle, and at the end. So it's like, okay, so that, that was fun, except it wasn't, although I think the performances are really good. As opposed to something like Oliver Stone's Nixon, where you know Oliver Stone is not a fan of Nixon, but he is curious. He's curious, how did this person whose actions I so abhor, how did he arrive here? And so it's a shockingly maybe not sympathetic, but I think it's a surprisingly empathetic portrait. And I think it's because Oliver Stone, even if he has an agenda and a philosophy, he still wants to approach his films as art first. And he wants to get to the bottom of something instead of just use it as a polemic. And so, you know, at most films have a philosophy and I, I don't, one thing that frustrates me, I wound up talking way more about this than I thought. I'm sorry. I've given a lot of these interviews and this is usually the stuff I don't say. You're, you're catching me on the end of a series of interviews. So I'm probably coming across as pretty reactionary right now. And I apologize. Um, but I do think that like to, to dismiss, to dismiss any type of film because of the philosophy that it might espouse is something that I think is, is limiting and something that I don't like when a critic does, I feel like a critic should be as open as, as possible, especially when it comes to the, down to that idea, that Roger Ebert idea of a movie isn't what it's about, it's how it's about it. You know, I mean, obviously I find Triumph of the Will abhorrent. <laughs> and yet as a documentary, it's pretty great. Like it is, it is, a, it is a perfect portrait of how Germany saw itself and how it wanted to see itself. Even the title, Triumph of the Will, as opposed to the, 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 propag the American propaganda series, Why We Fight. Like one is, you've got two very forceful words, triumph and will, whereas the American, it's very much like, hey, we don't wanna fight, but we are, and here's why. Like even in the title, uh, it's capturing the essence of like the, the mood, the national mood at the time. And so you look at the, the images in something like Triumph of the Will and like Lenny Riefenstahl is doing an amazing job of actually documenting this horrendous thing. And I think it actually is possible to acknowledge what she is doing while also saying the, the society she's capturing is a tremendously uh, monstrous one. And so all that is to say, the secondary audience was critics who had written off Christian film as a potential, uh, a potentially uh, intriguing and effective art form. I could have just said that. I'm sorry. 
No, that was great. And yeah, there are so many things I want to dive into with all of that. But um, you're, you're welcome to. Clearly, I'm feeling candid. <laughs> well, one of the points you made that I thought was really interesting was when you're talking about how Christian films are kind of becoming their own genre and mm-hmm. like faith-based films follow those like sets of turning into their own genre and having the same tropes and the same themes and I had never thought about it that way because like I am a Christian I am a film fan I have had a weird um relationship with Christian films haven't we all yeah so so but I hadn't thought of it like that that they are fitting into this genre and it's not just that they're cliche and unoriginal it's that they're kind of following the same tropes and that made me like a little more tolerant of them I guess in some ways so how is that an important way to distinguish what they are that actually changes how we approach them well I think it it really is like any new genre is not identified as a genre immediately in fact usually a a genre or maybe a subgenre when it first shows up the fans are the ones that respond to it well and it's often critics who write it off because they see it as a an a they see it as a defective version of an established thing so like for example um in in the film i talk about slasher movies and you know horror movies have been around for a while but then the slasher movie shows up and it starts with halloween which critics liked um and i guess you had stuff sort of like texas chainsaw massacre but that's a little bit different because that's an instance where people are going into a house they're putting themselves in danger as opposed to uh michael myers or jason Voorhees, where he they go out to pursue people anyway but I mean, you look at uh, Siskel, Ebert, any number of, of film critics at the time, and they're familiar with horror. And then they look at, you know, Friday the 13th, and they simply see it as this is a bad horror movie. And then after a while, you start to see there's just so many slasher movies in the 80s that not only that critics, it took them so long to, to pick up on that, like, not only is this bad horror, but it's doing the same thing over and over again. There are tropes, there's imagery. And then before you know, it's like, oh, there, yeah. When it's the same story, same character type, similar imagery, similar vibe, similar themes. Well, what is that if not its own genre, you know, but it's not always clear. You need to like, t- uh, you need time for it to develop, but the fans, uh, they pick on, pick up on it almost immediately which is something I find really interesting. It, like a genre is usually, is usually defined by, uh, by its fan base and then eventually it is declared this by the critics, but the critics are always behind the fans on that one. And so, uh, so it's like the same things that people say about Christian film, like, oh, well, they're so predictable. You know, you're always gonna have this kind of scene. You're always gonna have that kind of scene. It's always gonna end on this note. And it's like, yeah, that's true. What else is that true of? Probably Westerns, a lot of science fiction, a lot of uh, zombie movies, you know. Um, and so if it's just predictability and just the returning to certain things because that's what its intended audience likes, well, that is definitely a genre. Now, it, it doesn't have to be a genre you like. I'm not a big fan of slasher movies, right. but I can still acknowledge that a, this is probably not for me, uh, and B, that the people that it is for really get something out of it. And so, so then the problem comes with, it's like, well, if it's, if it's that, then what right do we have to criticize it at all? And it's like, well, there are still, there's still success and failure within genre. There are better slasher movies and worse slasher movies. So, so I think looking at it that way, it helps us to frame what a Christian movie can be. And already, by the way, there's now a subgenre of the sick kid miraculously healed movie. Right. You know, and that's starting to become its own thing. Oh, and it's also, and it's based on a true story and the, the narrative beats and usually the visual design is similar, whether it be miracles from heaven, heaven is for real uh, breakthrough. I feel like there are a couple others, but um, 
but yeah, that's actually becoming a subgenre, and uh, and it's fun, and I think it's fun and invigorating to acknowledge, even if I have very little patience for the films themselves. Yeah. Also, the films about like Christian singers feels like there's a couple of those that are coming out now. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, by the same directors, no less. Like, I yeah. there's I can only imagine. Then I still believe. I I wrote a so the 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 idea of film as a genre like it's it's a i i feel like it's a f- kind of a smaller section in the film but it came out of i recently so i went back to school a few years ago i went to UCLA and i uh got my master's degree in cinema and media studies and the the my final paper for one of my classes was called christian social drama uh the emergence of a new genre and <laughs> And it's interesting because there are things that I didn't necessarily incorporate into the film that are part of that essay, which I don't know if I have anymore. Yeah. I would send it to you if I if I could find it, but it's it's probably on some drive somewhere, and I don't even know. Anyway, um, but one of the things is that there is often, not always, but there is often a declarative aspect to Christian films, even in their title. God's not dead. Do you believe? I still believe. Heaven is for real, uh, you know, stuff like that. And now, granted, some of those are based on, on you know, uh, song titles. But nonetheless, like, it really, from a, one could say pandering, I'll say catering, because I'm feeling nice, by <laughs> catering to an audience and trying to assure the audience that I'm on your side, there's no better way to do that than with a, an unvague, declarative, broad title, like, God's not dead, like, you know, if you're if you're a Christian who frankly is not that interested in film as an art form, but interested in it as a ministry tool as something that affirms what you already believe, then it's like, well, I also believe that God's not dead. So what choice do I have but to see this movie? I have to support it. Yeah. And for the record, uh, on my podcast, Battleship Pretension, when we were, like every other website, when we were talking about the best movies of the decade, we also said, what is the worst movie of the decade? And I picked God's Not Dead. Fair enough. <laughs> so. Yeah. So with this like growing popularity of faith-based films, now that we do have like big studios that are kind of making their own and they are bigger budget and like better made in a lot of ways, do you think there will ever be a point where it gets to where they're respected by critics or there's, it reaches out to a different group or do you think it's pretty much going to be limited to the people that it's made for? I'll be honest, I really don't know. I start to I start to get optimistic and think that, okay, well, these could be it it almost feels as though at the moment, like the Chris, the Christian film audience and film critics are very much at odds. Like the more a, a film that deals with faith, the more it pleases critics, the less it pleases the Christian audience, and vice versa. There are a couple of exceptions but they're not even full exceptions. Uh, I do talk about breakthrough in the film and that one, I feel like it is a hundred percent. It is a Christian film. It has a, it's, you know, sick kid miraculously healed. It's, it's that uh, based on a true story. Uh, It's got good actors. It's got Chrissy Metz, Josh Lucas, Topher Grace, like good, good cast doing pretty good work. And it's also doing specific things within it that aren't necessary in the broad pandering sense, but is necessary in a character and narrative sense. Like its main character is a bit of a, she's kind of a busybody and she is very openly critical of the, of the, the hip young pastor at church. And it's like, if you've, if you've been to any church in the United States for long enough, you've seen, uh, men and women that are like this, that they have a very clear way of doing things. Uh, I know somebody, his name is Doc Benson, who made a film called Seven Deadly Words. And the words are, we've never done it that way before. And it's about a, a young pastor who comes to a church that is a little bit complacent. And even though I, I think that movie is also kind of broad and where, and and is a little bit too declarative in its dialogue, the, you do find certain filmmakers that are willing to talk about the fact that like, yes, this belief system may be correct, but the people who implement it are, are deeply flawed. 
And so you get something like, and that we are dealing with the ethereal, with the intangible. And so we're not going to know everything all the time. And so there are things within Breakthrough. It is something that affirms the faith of its viewer and the faith of its characters, and it rewards the faith of its character. Uh, but it also acknowledges that just because this story has a very clear beginning, middle, and end and has a happy ending, that doesn't mean that every ending, that everybody gets a happy ending in, in terms of, you know, I'm praying for this amazing thing to happen. And you know what? The, it didn't. Um, and, and the movie I still believe, which I think is flawed, uh, I think certainly narratively, I think it has some issues, but that's one where the main character didn't get what he wanted. Um, and I feel like, as you start to get more Christian films that are less interested in, aff in affirming and pandering uh, to its audience and more interested in reflecting their actual experience, you know, I as a Christian have not had a perfect life. I assume you haven't either. And if I watch a movie where everything turns out great for people because they are Christian, it's like that does not reflect my experience. And I feel like as audiences get a little bit more sophisticated, as Christian audiences get a little bit more sophisticated, and after the initial novelty of Christian film, after a while, I think they'll start to be like, I want something that is real and honest it, to my own experience. And so as that happens, I do think as much as I might lambast uh, Christians for like, uh, sorry, critics, pardon me, for, um, for being a little bit too hard on Christian film, I do think that what they ultimately are responding to is I think a dishonesty within Christian film, a, a, an unwillingness on the part of the money people and the director to tell us, tell the story the way it would emotionally feel, you know? And as you start to have a more mature audience that demands more, you'll start to see ideally more movies that are willing to take that risk and occasionally say, Hey, I don't actually know. Um, I pray and I hope, but I don't know and I can't guarantee. And the more you get that, the more honest it's going to be. And I do think that critics might be might get to be more on board with that. Like Breakthrough uh, received some, some level of positivity from critics. Um, and so I do think that it's possible. I don't, from a timeline standpoint, I don't know when that would be, maybe 10, 15 years, maybe sooner than that, who's to say. But, um, but right now, I also just think, as long as there are movies like, for example, the God's Not Dead franchise, which focuses not merely on telling audiences that they're right, but that no one else understands them and people are actively looking to persecute them, then it really creates an us and them mentality. And if the, if the film is creating that, I am not going to fault a critic for saying, all right, if you want us and them, then you know what? I guess I'm them. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fault a critic for that. So as long as there's, as there are movies that I think are willing to be honest about what it is to live this life, I think critics will start to appreciate that more, especially once they remember where this whole thing started. Mm -hmm. So like in the film, you talk about how there's kind of this divide between the Christian films that are that kind of like genre faith based, really heavy handed ones. And then films like silence that are like deal a lot with faith and, but are more, um, critically acclaimed kind of well-made films and yeah. there's kind of this divide so i don't know do you i guess i'm hoping that we can get to the point where those kind of meet in the middle yeah. a little bit more so. and i do you know i mean when you're talking about faith or politics or anything like that of course you're not just coming up against the films themselves you're coming up against a person's beliefs and this is where i start to be maybe a little bit too critical of fellow christians um because I do think there's that, there's that song, you know, give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. And there's that idea of good enough. And while I do understand that not everything can be explained and that when you, when you live a life of faith, there are, you are making a certain level of peace with not knowing everything. I do think that Christians often, especially in the United States where it is sort of, Christianity is sort of the default in many ways from a cultural standpoint. And so as a result, I, I think there are a lot of Christians who are not fully willing to engage with the complexity of the belief system. 
um, which is why you see somebody like a Joel Osteen doing so well, where he makes things so black and white, which is if you believe this, God wants you to have good things. So just keep believing and you'll have those good things. It's like, though, that's pretty simple and simplistic. And so as you know, so when you have, if you have Christians that are looking to really engage with how difficult it is to believe these things sometimes and how, like when you think like, you know, when you pray, it's easy to just be on autopilot. But when you take the time to realize, like, I am at the moment plugging into the creator of the universe who is outside of time and who apparently is interested in what I have to say. That's astonishing to me. And that, that the, the, the size of that, which is, of course, all encompassing and infinite while also being tremendously personal, is something that is, you know, if you think too much about it, you'll probably go insane. But I, I, I like when fellow Christians at least acknowledge just how astonishing that is. And so then you get movies like Tree of Life, which in which Terrence Malick, the way I've described it, uh, and of course it's, this is most people, if they, if they hear this, I guess uh, it's just audio, but like, um, and if you write it down, whatever. But uh, the way I describe Tree of Life, it's like, it's a film that is interested in God and God and recognizing it's the same one, you know, like the idea that, yes, you, you see like the, (laughs) you see dinosaurs walking the earth. Then you also see the trials and tribulations of a, of one family in one time. And the idea that both can, that when you're dealing with a, a, a deity that is outside of time, that both of these are happening at the same time and he's equally invested in both. That is to me astonishing. And yet so many Christian films are more than willing, as I think a lot of Christians are, to simply settle, to just settle for mundane. Even the films that deal with miraculous healing um, are so, they're so much more content to just deal with the everyday and really, I think, trivialize and oversimplify the faith. And I think that's something that critics respond to as well. When you've got somebody like like a uh, Paul Schrader or a Terrence Malick or uh, a Martin Scorsese, just to mention some American filmmakers, much less somebody like an Ingmar Bergman, when you have them willing to really engage with the complexity and the difficulty of living this out, then like, yeah, the, the oversimplified Christian films they're absolutely going to come up short, but I, my hope is that as more, again, this goes to, I think, to the, the level of sophistication and like the, the average v- fan of Christian films, Cin- cinematic uh, sophistication, please. Uh, I don't, I don't mean to suggest uh, that they're, that they're just a bunch of uh, rubes or anything like that. But I think as somebody becomes, as, as people become more well ver- or better versed in the cinematic language, I think they will come to understand that to sim- to have a character question is not the same as the film questioning, nor is it encouraging you to actively doubt. In fact, it could be that the more you question, the deeper an appreciation you have for this thing, as opposed to if you question it, it means it, it's, pro- it's, it's, it, it's questionable, you know? And so, um, I think I've, I think I've, uh, as, t- as tends to happen, I think I've drifted away from the initial question. <laughs> no, that's good. And yeah, um, and this is just my thoughts connected to that, but I feel like that's an area where the church has really like hurt their testimony and hurt their like outreach and that like, we're looking at these films as a way to have a ministry and have an outreach to people, but they're actually like making the divide further, which is frustrating to me. Well, and if you look at, I mean, honestly, it it astonishes me that like Christians demand certain things of their movies, but they readily, and then they follow Jesus, who both in his actions was always willing to meet the person where they were. And then in his parables, uh, told stories that incorporated all kinds of like questionable content. You know what I mean? Like if you were to make a straightforward faithful adaptation of Jesus parables, you'll have violence, you'll have debauchery, all that sort of thing. And it doesn't, just because the story contains, it doesn't mean you need to be super explicit about it. But I feel like there are some, you know, I go back to something like Fireproof. And while I do have an appreciation for the sincerity of Alex Kendrick, because I feel like he makes movies that are personal to him. He is not 
making a political calculation like I see with, for example, the God's Not Dead movies. Um, But I do think that he is, I feel like he's not being totally honest either. You know, you look at something like Fireproof and you have two characters that are, you have a husband and wife that are not Christian and yet they argue and and their, their marriage is on the brink of divorce. And yet they argue like, a, mar- a Christian married, co- a super conservative Christian married couple that has the healthiest marriage in the world. I'm married. I've been married for 15 years. I'm a Christian. My wife is a Christian. We have had our ups and downs. And when we've had our downs, it's hard. Anybody listening to our argument would be deeply uncomfortable, undoubtedly. And yet I, I watch something like Fireproof that would seem to be about non Christian, you know, a non Christian marriage. And it's the safest and tamest thing you've ever seen. Like there's no real sense of urgency. Um, And uh, yeah, I feel like it's, I feel like, as you say, we, we do ourselves a disservice when the, the world we depict, whether it be a Christian world or a non-Christian world is so not what, what it actually is. It goes back to what I was saying about dishonesty. Like people are so, I think audiences are so afraid of like, well, I don't, I don't like to hear that language. It's like, well, I'm sorry. Uh, (laughs) Like, like I'm astonished. Like I, I mean, admittedly, I probably swear more than I should in life because I think the words have power and I feel like the more I swear, the less power I give them. But at the same time, just in life, you just walk around and people, whether we like it or not, are definitely more comfortable swearing casually. And if you're going to try to depict the world as is instead of the world as Christians wish it would be, um, then you're going to have to incorporate some of this stuff. Like, I'm not saying that we all necessarily live in a rated R world, but we live in at least a PG-13 world. And if there, if there in fact are Christians out there who are so cloistered that these words are genuinely scandalous to them to, to hear even at all, then it's like, okay, well, they're probably not engaging with the world as it is anyway, and they need movies even more right. to, to depict uh, the, the world as it is. Right. So with that and thinking too about i love how you go through like the history of film and then kind of like track the church's relationship with it in the film so like why do you think there has been this divide from so early on do you think it is just like objectionable content that christians are just scandalized i think a lot of it could come down to certainly that level i love that word scandalized you know it just it just speaks to like you know, hearing, hearing a piece of profanity and literally fainting away uh, as you clutch your pearls. But anyway, um, I mean, I do think it's that, but I think a lot of it comes down, speaking about the church as one unified thing, which is not a good idea to do, but I, I'm going to do it right now. Um, I do think a lot of it comes down to power. Um, I think historically, the church has been so favored in the United States that when they start to fall out of, of favor or, you know, not even fully out of favor, when they start to have slightly less power than they did, then suddenly it is, they're scandalized and it is often viewed as persecution. Uh, but on top of that, it's, we, we don't have control of the narrative anymore. And that might force us to engage with ideas or people that we wouldn't have had to otherwise. And so as the, uh, as the Hayes code went away in favor of the, the rating system in the 1960s, you started to, and as movies were, you know, uh, competing with television and it's like, well, what can we do that movie that TV can't? Okay. Well, we can have profanity. We can have nudity. Um, And so, the church, which had, which held sway over Hollywood for so long, felt like, oh, well, this is clearly a rejection of us and we don't have the power anymore. And now, uh, now people that go see movies, they are not going to be subjected overtly or covertly to a Christian system of morality, you know, uh, because when you watch, like, I remember I was watching a, uh, I was watching like a, a blooper reel of movies, like from movies of the 1940s. Mm-hmm. 
and there's a moment where Humphrey Bogart flubs a line and he says, if you'll pardon me, he says, God damn it. And I was like, whoa, wait, wait, what? It's like <laughs> Humphrey, Humphrey Bogart doesn't talk like that. That's weird. And it's like, well, no, but there was still profanity back then. There was still that sort of thing. It just wasn't in film. So like film, even then, like it wasn't reflecting the way the world actually was. It was reflecting the way the Legion of Decency and the Hays Code wanted it to. And so I think, and because film is so visible, I think there are people, I'm probably one of them in the, over the course of my life, who get their image of the world from film. And I think it allows them to pretend that the world is something it is not. And so then you have the Hays Code go away and now Christians are suddenly faced with the world as it is, and they can no longer pretend to themselves or force on other people uh, this image, this squeaky clean image of the world. And so, where you know morality, Christian morality, is always affirmed at the end. And so, I think it comes down to feeling adrift, feeling betrayed, and ultimately this idea: it's like we had a we had a firm hand on this very influential uh, of mediums. And now we don't, we do not have that level of power anymore. And we also don't know how we can possibly compete with it. And it's that feeling of wanting to compete with it that Christian film comes out of. Um, and of obviously it still can't, but you know, they're trying. They're trying. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, out of curiosity, my own curiosity, because I grew up in much more like conservative fundamental circles. Mm -hmm. um, so do you know about Bob Jones University and like uh, unusual films and Sheffy? <laughs> and I, I saw one, I don't remember the name of it, but I saw a Bob Jones film about like, I think it was, the, it was a film about like the first guy to translate the Bible okay. into some language or whatever. And the Catholic church burned him at the stake. And uh, I don't remember the name of the guy. I don't remember the name of the film, but I did watch that. And the production values were pretty low, but the story was interesting. Yeah, yeah. I um, Yeah, I went to Bob Jones and they're much better now than they were <laughs> yeah. back when they were making those films. And I did a film class there and we watched like Tree of Life and <laughs> things like that. So mm. I'm very proud of where my school's headed. By, sure. Uh, a very interesting history and yeah films like Sheffy was the the classic one that everyone just like and i don't know i don't know that one what is that it's um about <laughs> an evangelist like revival services um evangelist i can't even i think it's based on a true story but okay. yeah it's kind of like the extreme end of of what i've seen of like we got to make our own films to compete with hollywood and so we're gonna and they're they're pretty corny so <laughs> and i think it's a couple of things number one is like uh in some of my in some of the reviews which thankfully have been largely positive but there have been some who say like you know why didn't he bring up the 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 very direct response to new hollywood you know, movies like A Thief in the Night and like the the fairly low budget movies that like played in church basements in the 1970s. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I probably should have. Uh, I knew that I like I was aware of it, but I also I think I I was worried about like trying to cram too much into a small amount of time. Um, and given the for and given the format of the film, I was like, I don't want this thing to be too long. It's just me talking over clips. <laughs> um, but uh but yeah, so there's that. And then I also, the other thing is like, I want to specify, uh, yes, I was raised in a, in a fairly conservative denomination. Uh, and I myself politically am still fairly right leaning. I'm not super thrilled with where the right currently is. And so uh, I've distanced myself a little bit, but philosophically, I'm still, I'm still fairly right leaning. Uh, and then my, 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 uh, my Christianity is, is pretty traditional as well in many ways. But I don't see how being politically right leaning or being or having a, a traditional view of the Bible, I don't actually see how that for for any reason uh, can keep me from embracing artistic complexity. And I think a lot of people seem to think that those two things can't go together. Um, I. Uh, I mean, I used my own name, but thankfully my name is kind of generic. So I don't think, I don't know if anybody put two and two together, but I, I for a few months this year, I, I was writing for the Daily Wire. Um, and my reason for that was one that probably was born out of a certain degree of uh, condescension, which was 
you know, I've been talking to Christians about film for so long and now not as a function of me, but just in general, uh, a lot more Christians are open to the idea of what film can be. Conservatives, on the other hand, are so, so suspicious and condemning of Hollywood, which don't get me wrong, Hollywood is very suspicious and condemning of conservatives. <laughs> it, is, it is a mutual thing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the, the way in which, the very straightforward way in which uh, conservatives, especially conservative commentators, uh, approach film in general like the sheer number of times that i've heard it's like i just want to be entertained it's like okay that's fine that's about a person's expectations but then when someone says movies are only supposed to be entertaining me uh, entertaining it's like okay well now you're being prescriptive and now you're being extremely limited in your viewpoint uh also we have different we all have different definitions of entertainment and so i started writing for the daily wire knowing that most of them would hate most of the readers would hate what I wrote and I was not wrong. Yeah. Um, but every once in a while there, there'd be someone who said, Oh, that sounds really good. I'll have to. And I'm like, all right, I got, I got one for the hundreds, hundreds that hated what I would write. I got a couple and I'll, I'll take what I can get. But, uh, but anyway, so um, okay. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh yeah. And Bob Jones. Yeah. That's, that's crazy that they showed uh Tree of Life. That that is that very much flies in the face. Not that I think that is a particularly offensive film, but it is a it is a weird film. And uh, weird. Well, that's not what we like. Right. Yeah. No. You know? I really appreciated that film class, and um, Mr. Zeidowitz, who taught it, was great. And I feel yeah. like a little more open minded than a lot of teachers at the school have been in the past. So yeah. that was. And he, you know, looked honestly too at what the school has done and its response has been in the past and kind of yeah, where we're going with it. So, but it was, it is interesting just to see the range of response even within Christian circles and just the differences in the ones that are more skeptical and the ones that are more embracing things. Yeah. And I think honestly, living in Los Angeles has, has, uh, and then Chicago before that, I think I'm a little bit spoiled honestly, because so many people that I, that I, so many Christians that I know out here, even if they're not in the film industry, they know plenty of people that are. And so they're a little bit more open to what film can be. And then I, I moderated a panel at Azusa Pacific university about whiplash uh, and, you know, discussing the idea of morality versus not that it has to be versus, but in that movie, it kind of is um, morality versus like, um, quality or, or perfection or striving for, for greatness and trying to do the best that has been with what has been provided with you as far as resources or talent or whatever. And it, you know, where is that line where you sacrifice, you know, personal relationships in favor of that. And so it was a, it was a fun panel. Uh, and then I also did a, a live, uh, podcast at uh, Biola University talking about Guardians of the Galaxy. So it was a few years ago. <laughs> but, but that's the thing. So like, and those are both like Christian schools, one slightly more conservative than the other, but still both fairly that. Um, but they have a film, they both have film departments that are very committed to really trying to engage with what film can be and that even movies that are not overtly Christian or even seek to overtly talk about faith uh, condemning or not, uh, that, you know, if you think in a broad enough way, um, and if you want to really get down to the, the nitty gritty of theme, there are plenty of movies that are, that are deeply, uh, faith oriented, even if the filmmaker himself doesn't know it. Um, so anyway. Yeah. So I guess just like thinking about making, this film like what was that process like for you how did you decide to do this how did you go about making it happen <laughs> so it came about because I had some spare time <laughs> I was in between semesters uh, it was last summer and I and I had been and I had already done a like a nine part little series called faith and filmmaking I had already done that for faith life and I'll be honest, I'm not super proud of it. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not naturally an editor and I was doing that while I was teaching classes. And so like, it has its moments, but for the most part, it's, I see it as more of, a, more of a 
gateway than anything else. Um, and then I had made a couple other video essays. I made one about Jurassic world that I was quite proud of. And, um, and so I, and I, I'm a big fan of the documentary Los Angeles plays itself. I don't know if you've seen it, but it, I highly recommend it. Um, and, uh, and then I, I'm not friends, but I'm friendly with the guy that made room 237, which is the documentary about, uh, people's different interpretations of the shining mm -hmm. and the idea of, of just video essays, but also the idea that a video essay could be a viable possibility for like a real movie. Obviously this kind of thing would never play in theaters. Uh, mm -hmm. but in, in the world of streaming, like absolutely, it could be like an actual thing that we send to critics. So I entertain this notion thinking about that essay that I had written in school and thought like, okay, well maybe I can, maybe they'll, they'll go with this. And they really liked the idea of trying to add some level of academic scholarship to the, the discussion about what Christian film can be and something that could potentially appeal to uh, uh, non-Christian critics as well as Christian ones. And so it sort of came about uh, from that. And so I wrote it, um, I wrote it in a few weeks in June and then I spent the rest of the time like gathering clips. And so I, I cut it together in probably about four or five weeks. Wow. And, um, yeah, like I said, I had free time. I had nothing else to do. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then my friend AMC, you know, that's the thing is like this wound up being because they didn't, give me the budget I wanted. Uh, I wound up having to narrate it myself, which was not my intention. I did not want it to be the Tyler Smith show. But, uh, but you know, when they gave me the budget that they gave me, it's like, well, I can't afford to pay anybody else. So I guess I'll do it myself. Um, but the only other person involved was my friend, uh, Amcy Hernandez, who's a, a composer. And only one review ha has mentioned the music. And I love the music. I think it works so well. It's music I listen to just on my own. I feel like he really captured the spirit of what I was trying to do. And I feel like it's propulsive when it needs to, needs to be. And it could just be that like, I was very aware of how the film worked just with my narration, pretty dry. Uh, then that music comes along and it really, man, it really helps. I, I'm often astonished by the vitality of movie music. Like you wouldn't think that it's incredibly important. And then you, then you see what a film looks like without it. It's like, Oh, this is gross. Um, you know, you hear those stories about like psycho being shown with and without the music and people, you know, obviously there was going to be music, but it, they didn't know it was going to be that music. And suddenly the, the film worked like so much more than it. I think Hitchcock said that that movie is like 30% music as far as like its level of success. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, it, it came about as a, as a, as a desire to bring in some money, add to the larger conversation while I had some time. And, uh, so that was, that was the deal. That's great. So what was the most challenging part of making it? I think, you know, you, like when you write it, it's very, it's very easy to like imagine, to just to just write everything that you're thinking and then you cut it down and all that. But then when you realize that, you know, this isn't a podcast where it's pure audio and you can just say what you want for as long as you want, you realize that everything you say has to have an image over it. And usually I would write something knowing what the image would be, or at least having an idea. But then you realize, well, I can't just stay, you know, stay with this clip for a minute and a half, like that will be boring. Mm -hmm. So I'll need to have, you know, maybe 20 seconds of this clip. And then I have to fill in the rest with clips that are relevant to the thing that I am saying, even if they're not what I had in mind when I was saying it. So that's something that you come to realize is like, I need to fill in some blanks here. And that itself became a, a process because then you have to find you have to find clips that are high quality. Obviously, I used some clips that were not high quality because they're what were available to me, unfortunately. Again, the budget was very low. Um, yeah. and, and there was a bit of a deadline as well, which I think I had imposed on myself, but then I still stuck to it. Um, 
And so it was, uh, so that was probably from a logistical standpoint, that was probably the biggest challenge was realizing how big this thing was. Like when I did my, when I did my, um, my video essay on Jurassic world, essentially comparing it to Jurassic park and that sort of thing is like, well, I, I, there are only two movies that I can pull from, uh, to compare these two. So like, all right, so I just need to find something within there. It's limited, but within that limitation, there's tremendous, uh, freedom. It's not overwhelming. Whereas when it's the whole of American film, because I do focus primarily on American film, it's like, oh, all right, well, I uh, did not think this through, <laughs> uh, but uh, but it worked out in the end. There, I like, I know what I'm. I know what it's missing, and uh, there are things that I'm frustrated. That's the other thing is when you work on something completely by yourself. If you have a blind spot, it stays a blind spot. <laughs> you know, for example, I love the work of Terrence Malick. I think he does tremendous work in regards to faith and exploring faith. Uh, you won't find any clips from his movies in this film because I forgot to write anything in and then just kept right on forgetting until <laughs> finally the movie was over and I watched it. Admittedly, I was also focusing, I was, I was spending so much time on uh, silence that it was sort of like that and Tree of Life, I feel like are the most interesting, like uh, officially non-Christian movies to deal with faith. So I was, I was so laser focused on silence that I simply forgot about tree of life. And it kills me that I, that that happened and that it was let stand every step of the way from writing the narration to recording the narration, to laying on the clips, to watching it in its entirety. I forgot about the, the whole of Terrence Malick's filmography. So I'm not particularly proud of that. And I feel like that if this movie were perfect, which it is not, uh, if this were perfect other than that, then I feel like that that still drops it down to at least uh, to at most a B. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, so there, there are some challenges to a project like this. Yeah. I feel like I could just keep talking to you for a long time. Cause I, feel yeah, like yeah. Sick, but <laughs> I should probably no. let you go soon, but and I will say, you know, it's uh, n actually nobody has asked, like, how did you decide what clips to be were, were going to be a part of it? Um, so I've had two, I've had one podcast since 2007 and then a second one since 2009. The 2009 one is called More Than One Lesson and it is film discussion from a Christian perspective. And so, uh, you know, I, the whole point of it was to as we were talking about before, take movies that may not emit, you might not immediately think of as having any relevance to like a Christian audience and acknowledging that at, at its core, again, even maybe without the director's conscious awareness, these are films that affirm in some capacity, uh, like, uh, the biblical idea of, of truth. And it goes, I think it goes back to sort of that CS Lewis idea of defining art or at least sincere art as something that is, that is using allegory or, uh, you know, any number of the other, you know, any, any kind of uh, artistic utility um, in order to search for the truth. And I am of the opinion that you can only search for the truth with a lowercase t for so long before you at least encounter, if only for a moment, the truth with an uppercase t. And so I think a lot of people, you know, I was uh, on, on, Battleship Retention, um, my, my primary podcast, uh, we had uh, Pete Holmes on there a few years ago, uh, back before he was way too big to be on the show um, and had his own HBO show and all that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and he was raised in the church and, and he and I had this conversation about like, whether it be The Matrix or a movie like Brubaker or Superman, like there are movies that consciously or unconsciously keep returning back to this, this thing, this, this idea, whether it be the, the story of Christ or certain concepts of redemption or whatever it is. And, and Pete said, yeah, he goes, it's, he said, I don't really believe this stuff anymore, but he goes, you come to realize just how vital uh, biblical concepts have been to the way people think about art and about about narrative as well. You know, I mean, you look at the Iron Man movies, 
And you look at, at, especially the first one, you look at the, his arc, it's very much a Saul to Paul situation, you know? And so even so much so that, uh, you know, he's, he's Tony Stark initially, but the, the last line of the film is I am Iron Man. Like he's, he literally has had to take on this, this new identity in order to make up for the wrongs of the past and try to make things right. And it's like, yeah, it's a basic redemption story, but at the same time, it's one thing to, oh, I've made some mistakes. It's another thing to, I've, made, I've actively made the world a worse place, but it's not too late for me. And I do feel like, especially these days, the idea is like, well, you've made mistakes, so it, and you've made the world a worse place. There's no forgiveness. There is no redemption for you. And, uh, and so any film, even one as mainstream and big and obviously committee-driven as Iron Man, still in, still speaks to that very Christian idea of redemption and uh, being able to shift from who you are, who you were to who you can be. And, uh, and you find that in stuff like Hellboy and, and all kinds of superhero movies. But uh, all that is to say that I've been thinking like this for a long time. And so when the time came to write this, as I said, I still needed to fill in with other movies, but um a lot of this has been in my head for a long, long time because even before the podcast, I've been defending movies to fellow Christians for most of my life, yeah. uh, despite being raised in a in a fairly tra- uh, fairly conservative uh, denomination. My parents, I am so grateful. My parents were tremendously what I call movie positive. Uh, they liked movies, and they did not shy away from showing me movies. Obviously they didn't want me watching anything rated R before I was able to, but then once they saw the movies that I was interested in, I think they were able to adapt instead of being dogmatic about it and say, okay, well at age, this, this is the example I use at age 14, Tyler is interested in Barbet Schroeder's reversal of fortune about Klaus von Bülow starring Jeremy Irons. You know what? I think we can trust him. I think his tastes are different than, this, the usual teenage boy uh, who, you know, at age 14, it's like, oh, an R-rated movie, which ones have nudity in them? Right. And uh, whereas for me, it's like, it's like, oh, Jeremy Irons won an Oscar for this movie. I, get, I, be, I guess I better see it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I was, I was very blessed to have the, the family that I did have and, and lucky to go to the churches that I did because, you know, I, like, I had youth pastors who – made it clear that for themselves, they even as adults would not watch rated R movies. But when they found out that I was watching them, they're like, Hey, you know, uh, to each his own. Yeah. I was like, that, well, to each his own. What? <laughs> what you, what youth pastor in the Midwest says that, you know, very few. Uh, and so uh, anyway, yeah, it's, so in a way, I've been I've been prepping for this movie my whole life, and th- and this micro budget film is what came out of it. So I guess I'll take what I can get. No, it was great. I think it's a good conversation that not enough people are having. That I think is one that I'm going to be telling people to watch because it adds to a lot of what I've been wanting to try to express to people. Yeah. So. No, I appreciate it. Really exciting and fun to get to talk to you. So. But uh, but yeah, so thanks for thanks for talking. It was nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. All right, take it easy.